the north and the future of Nigeria. The late Adamu Chiroma was there, the late Boba Karimi was there, and there were 2,000 people in the hall. And I warned that there were violence on a scale never known in our history, mainly in northern Nigeria. And I gave my reasons. I said, most of the industries in Kano, Kaduna, and elsewhere had died under the assault of SAP. Agriculture had declined, and the only thriving industry in the north is politics. Now, politics itself doesn't feed. It can encourage, by sound policies, people to grow their economy and live a better life. If it doesn't, it's a disaster. I was told by some people I was being too academic that Northerners don't behave like that. Well, five years later, Boko Haram began under Yarago. Yarago was at the airport on his way to Brazil when he gave instructions to the army to move to Borno and start quelling Boko Haram. It is not gone yet. So can we end the current violence among <coughs> younger people, mainly in northern Nigeria. This is the assignment that Sheikh Gumi is trying to fix. And with all due respect, sir, some people misunderstand you when you speak. Some condemn you, some praise you. But that's the issue. Is anybody talking to them? Will they ever be part of this kind of discussion? Here is a young man who's just made the point. The youth. They're not always around when we talk. We much older people. There has to be a bridge between the young and the old. And the old to retreat gently. Because the young must also also make a mistake that once they come in, they'll solve the problem overnight. You won't. Mm -hmm. I was young once. Mm -hmm. Every one of us was. I was a university teacher. Got to the House of Assembly at the age of 32. I was called by Shagari to Lagos at the age of 34. And then was reappointed as minister at 36 for the coup of 83. And then we checked into a Kirikiri prison for uh, postgraduate studies. <laughs> <laughs> and then we were able to sit among ourselves, ministers, governors, and so on, to look at the mirror and look at the past. At the time, we were to be executed. The uh, Rollins formula was proposed by certain members of the Supreme Military Council at the time. But the government did not take that option. And we came out, began life afresh. Some had learned lessons, some hadn't. And the military carried on making changes where they thought that things needed to be changed, and so on and so forth. Let me then go back to the question I asked earlier. Can we end the current violence? If we do, are we in danger of seeing it again in a more terrible form? What is it that allows people to set a bus on fire with human beings inside burning and look on? Our own children. They are the younger generation also who should take over the leadership as we old people go. Where is this barbarism coming from? I have a suggestion. Number one, the economy. Number two, the economy. And number three, a failed economy. All fueled by a mistaken theory of governance, which imagines that once you have a democracy, once elections are held, that you have attained it, you haven't. A democracy is absolutely useless if it does not promote the finest economic policies to bring livelihood to the people of society. Is China a democracy? The Chinese will tell you they have their own form of democracy, not the same as the Americans claim they have. Between Chairman Mao and Deng Xiaoping, in between Chiu Lai and uh, uh, Huawei Feng, 
China grew from a very bad world economy to where it is today. In fact, Huawei will fail, and Deng Xiaoping in particular. Deng was a laborer in Paris in 1920, a laborer in the factory, before he ran to Russia when the French government banned communists. Trained for a while in Russia, came back to join Mao, Chou Enlai and the others to fight Chiang Kai-shek and fight the Japanese. Today, the Chinese economy was built by them, just like China as a political unit was built by Mao. But then never attended a university for one hour. He said, I never stepped in a university. But he left behind an economy which is frightening Western Europe. The economy. We fell into a trap called SAP. We began devaluing our currency. Today it's 572 naira to one dollar. In 1981, one naira was 1.50. fifty cents. We were persuaded by people, very brilliant people who studied in Harvard and Oxford, worked with Mary Lynch, the World Bank, the Goldman Sachs, and they told us it was a final, final way of going. And so we fell into this, and yet we're a nation of importers of everything. Today it's impossible to build a factory and create a job for young people. See youths there. Ask any one of them what life is for them. They can't cook. They can't cook. They can't pay their rent. They can't feed. They can't run a car. They can't look after kids. It's not their fault. The economy just doesn't allow growth. If I take a loan at 27% to build a factory, I can never pay back. Somebody else in New Zealand, or um, Singapore, an Indian goes there, borrows for 2%, arrives here and sets up a factory. Within a year or two, he can employ me and my entire family. But I can't do that here. So the question here is, not just the social and political issues we're dealing with. Something is fundamentally wrong with the economy. Takuya Kasa is here man for whom I have tremendous respect. We had native authorities in the past. They built hospitals, they built roads, they gave scholarships, they did schools. Today, the local government system is a fiasco in 90% of the states. They do nothing. They don't own a crater to level a village road for the farmer to take his pickup and bring his goods to town. They don't repair a school, they don't repair a market, they don't repair, support a clinic. So what do 774 local governments do for us? And yet they receive on the average two to three hundred million a month. Where does the money go to? Unless and until we fix these serious economic issues, we can meet here a thousand times. Our situation can only get worse. Thank you very much.